So without further ado, Cheeky Midweeky, Luke Lewis. Welcome, brother. Thank you, man. How are you doing? I'm fucking tip top always. <laughs> if you do this in the morning and you don't feel wood, it's a good day. It means you're alive. <laughs> so um, for the uninitiated, who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? All that good stuff. Um, so obviously my name is Luke Lewis. Um, from Wales, as people can probably pick up now with this funny accent, um, which is not part of England, I'd like to point out, as we spoke about before we started. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> so, um, yeah, at the moment, I'm in Pennsylvania um, coaching, or what was coaching the rugby team and working with the ice hockey team as well. Um yeah, so like if you want me to go backtrack. Take your way, man, maybe. Yeah. So obviously growing up in Wales, started playing rugby from a young age and played all the way up um, to senior level. I was involved in some of the age grade stuff, so Scarlets and, and Wales age grades. And then got to, you know, the point where it's like, is it going to be professional, semi-professional? Um, I ended up going down the road, it was semi-professional. And then I also worked as a, a teacher and a coach on the side. Mm. Um, and I really enjoyed my rugby. It was awesome. Um, I was playing for a good good team, Sand of Ray's called in the Welsh Premiership. Um, and that was really the main thing for me. When we won the, the Swiller Cup, which is like national championships, that was like the catalyst for me to be like, well, for me your, personally. Uh, your Bluetooth, I think, is... Are you, are you, is your mic on your Bluetooth or on your computer? It's on, well, it's on, yeah. Do you want me to take your headphones off? Go, go audio in your ears and then yeah. get your mic because I think there's like, like, so oh, I can just take a whip. I can just take a We can edit that, hey, JJ. Is that right? We can, yeah. Fucking legend. Just, uh, yeah, pick up where you left off, bro. Hang on. Nightmare. Perfect. Perfect. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Um, yeah, so obviously I was playing rugby back home and then for me, the catalyst to actually move out to America was obviously my brother was living out here. So I've always felt like there was that opportunity of potentially moving out to America to, to, to pursue something. Um, yeah, so and then when we won the Swaler Cup, which is the Welsh Cup, that was the main thing for me to be like, right, okay, I've done what I set out to do and achieve in terms of the level I was playing at. Mm. I was enjoying the rugby coaching and teaching and things like that. But for me personally, I was like looking at guys that are maybe five, 10 years older than me. And I was like, they're still doing what I'm doing now in 10 years time. I don't want to go 10 years down the line and be like, that's all I fucking achieved. Mm. So in my head is like, right, I got to do something different and it's got to be outside the box. And uh, as Fernando will tell you, in Wales, you kind of get stuck in the same thing over and over and over. So I was like, right, it has to be outside of Wales. Um, and initially, I was thinking maybe I could play rugby somewhere in like France or uh, England or something like that. But I didn't want to continue the same thing elsewhere. So I just thought, fuck it, I'm just going to totally get get rid of the old life and, and move to America. So I played for university, a master's degree in strength and conditioning in Florida Atlantic, Florida Atlantic University. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I got in there, moved, and luckily I, I did uh, stay with my brother for the time being when I was studying. Um, when did he move to Vegas? Last year. Oh, okay. Yeah, very recent. So he was living in Florida, so that's why I went to Florida Atlantic. Mm. Um, so I stayed with him, so... I was actually studying, I was a GA there, so I was doing the strength and conditioning coaching, but I was also teaching like undergrad classes. And then on top of everything else, like I was helping my brother with the gym and um, his online stuff. So as everyone has been through the same thing when they're doing their GAs, like it's, you don't have fucking time to wipe your own ass. So that was tough, that was tough. Um, but it was a good challenge, that's what I wanted. Um, and then fast forward, obviously graduated and um, was on my OPT then to, to work. Uh, What's the OPT? 
OPT is like after you graduate, you get a year to work. So it's basically like uh, the US government saying like, hey, good work for graduating. Now give us some fucking taxes. Now find a wife. <laughs> <laughs> Pay us some taxes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I uh, worked then locally in supplement company because initially it was you know difficult to come straight out and get mm. a job in coaching. Um, but luckily... I, I'm friendly with Alex Cobbsiero. We mm. met. It was a strange, strange way we met. Um, I might, I'll probably go into it. I won't go into the full details, but basically... Was it a was, spicy affair? Yeah, there was a bit of a two, spicy two, affair, which I don't want to get two, into too much trouble. British rugby players, two British rugby players getting to know each other. Just We don't need to go there. How are you? <laughs> yeah. Basically, it was... Uh, Somebody had uh, posted something about him that I knew. I knew the person that posted about him, and I thought that they were friends because from the post it looked like they were friends. So I messaged that guy, like, "Hey, uh, I'm also a rugby player. It would be awesome if you know Alex. Like, link us up." But it turned out that the post was actually sarcastic, and the guy fucking hated Alex for something. So I had messaged this person to be like, "Hey, can you set us up?" And the guy has read my message and thought I was a fucking asshole. Thought he was like, I was winding him up. Um, but I somehow ended up speaking to Alex on social media. And we that's how we we got friends because we laughed at that situation. We we're like, fucking helmet. Like that, that was like a fucking weird as out there, dude. Yeah. And I was like, that was a fucking strange situation to be in. Um, so then we became friends. And he actually was doing some consultancy coaching around in some of the colleges here. And Penn State was one of them. So he he took me up there one week uh, for a week. Um, it was like two years ago now, and we did some forward forward coaching together. He did the the scrum, I did line out, um, and the court there was a coach there who was the backs coach, and he was like, "Well, would love to have you back." So I, that's how I made the move, and we came up here to. So it was technically for, like my main role was a forwards coach, but I was also doing like the conditioning, on field conditioning as well. So it's pretty cool. How how do you? I mean. We're, we're jumping around like the questions obviously we'll, we'll come back to some other stuff but like how do you find straddling those two worlds between s and c and and rugby I, mean, I feel i feel like you're well positioned to, to fill the gap that a lot of guys normally fall in but i feel like you almost run the risk of losing respect from either side you know what i mean yeah yeah it it's i feel like it's a good position to be in um because you you can understand the, the demands of, of both ends. And then you can also, also then kind of form a training session that's going to ma- like check the boxes on each side. Mm. Um, but like you just said, um, if you're like the middleman, you have to kind of please both ends then. So you're just kind of like sharing the information between the two rather than skills coach and strength coach coming together and having one conversation. I'm, I was kind of like the, mid- the middleman between the two. Um, but in terms of role, honestly, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, it was something that I feel like, especially in sports like rugby and, and in America, being like a young like a young sport out there, I think that's how it should be at the moment in terms of building the sport, so people that understand the demands of the strength and conditioning, because there's so many coaches out here that are strength and conditioning coaches. But obviously, like you know, like they don't understand the game. Um, so you know, it's it's best to have somebody that understands the game that has the knowledge of the strength and conditioning as well, rather than having somebody coming in and just applying like football American football to rugby and it just being way off. What what do you feel? Uh, how do you feel that's like manifested itself in what they do at Penn State. What would you say have been the biggest changes as a result of you coming in with that kind of role and skill set? Um, I I think it was more so like understanding um, how to plan out the week for a start, mm-hmm. but then and and consolidate the stress as not being like okay we have to just fucking tackle 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 every single day or ten on ten in a small grid like on a Tuesday then on a Wednesday. Mm-hmm. Um, and also just things like when you should put it in top end speed and not having guys then, you know, training and training on top of it. Um, 
but the main thing I think like just changing the mindset of that old school rugby mindset of what like conditioning looks like um and again like I took a lot obviously I take a lot from from what you put out there and plug of the strength coach network but um <laughs> the the tempos I really enjoy doing the tempos yeah because they also give me an opportunity to to run the progression but also then add in like the things like the grappling which were which were helping us because we had like limited time mm-hmm. we're not we're not a vast full varsity sport so we oh, were in Penn State yeah so it's like kind of like a half and half so it wasn't like we could have like okay you're in your like three hours the, the indoor facility is yours today like you had like an hour or so so you had to not, well, not much stuff. just because you're not a varsity sport doesn't mean that you don't take precedence because i can tell you for a fact at william and mary women's lacrosse once got bumped off a field for the quidditch team no way <laughs> yes. but, but they're boldly pursuing excellence continue <laughs> <laughs> that is insane. That's insane. But yeah, I, just like things like that. I really, I, I really enjoy doing the t- the, the tempo progressions with the grappling, um, and then for the coach to see then like, okay, we've done this grappling progression, and now they can get now they can go into maybe small sided games or um, condition drills where it's just focused on a grappling tackling technique and things like that because I think. If it's just a strength coach and a um, skills coach and the strength coach has no idea about rugby, that was the beauty about the role is that I could be like, well, this is going to help this, this and this in the game and really understand what we were actually focusing on and saying like, that's where, this is where we start. This is a progression. Now we're at this stage. Um, whereas right before I feel like the kind of contact stuff is just like this get... 10 on 10, 15 on 15, let's fucking throw them in. Perfect. And then you get like three fucking maniacs who love tackling, the, the, the back rowers and centers. Yeah. They're fucking flying in tackling. And it may be like other positions are shying off in the back and not really getting any any benefit from it. Um, so that kind of stuff, that was, that was the beauty of the job, uh, having like the, one foot in each camp. Like, Do you feel that because of your background, where you're from your accent that it's almost like instant credibility just add water when you when you come into an american team because i you know personally for me i experienced the the exact opposite like i couldn't possibly know what the fuck i was talking about because i'm english and i've never played football yeah yeah 100 percent um and then you'll you'll know this like a lot of guys that have the jobs out here in, in colleges they won't be American. They'll be South Africa, New Zealand, Australian. Mm. I feel like it's almost like a big check in the box in your interview pro- process. If you start talking and you have, especially like a New Zealand accent, they're like, all right, this guy must fucking know what he's talking about. Yeah. But so I've obviously sneaked under the radar, damn it, somehow. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I mean, the amount of fucking time is like, it happened in Argentina. It's like, oh, New Zealand don't, this. Are you, don't do this. Are you saying they're wrong? And I'm like, yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's why my next natural step is walking into professional football because, I mean, soccer because I'm Argentinian, so naturally I know the sport. Yeah, but they'll say you're Welsh, man. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it depends on the job. No, just only <laughs> only speaking Spanish. Pretend you don't understand English. Get a fucking translator. Depend, uh, I uh, I speak like this. Uh, I said the ball is life. Eh. So <laughs> if it comes to cheap, I'm Welsh. If it comes to soccer, I'm oh, Welsh. Yeah. <laughs> I went there. Yeah, I did. I did. Oh, so man. you know, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the being an immigrant to America because I know you and I privately have spoken. I was I was actually thinking about this myself the other day. I always, growing up, felt drawn to America. So the way that I characterize it to myself was that everywhere that I went prior to being in America, I was running away from because I didn't want to be in Northampton and I didn't want to be in England and I didn't want to be in rugby and all that kind of shit. But then when it came to America, I always felt like I was running towards America, Mm -hmm. which is a bit nostalgic and a bit immigrant. But do you do you feel like you were always going to end up here or was your brother already being here a major factor? I think my brother being here was the major factor. Um, yeah. yeah, it definitely opened my eyes to be like, well, there's a lot more out there. Um, I think personally, if I hadn't had him over here, I probably would have thought a lot 
of like the small town mentality where it's like, okay, you do this, you do this. Um, you play rugby for the rest of your life and you do the job that you've probably done for, for your entire life. And that's good because you're comfortable. Yeah. And I think he challenged my thought process on the way you look at your, at your life and don't accept kind of, you know, what the average is. And it, again, it's not like I'm out here, like living the dream, like in a mansion or anything, but it's just something that I put myself out in my comfort zone. And I think when I started thinking about it, that's when I had the same mentality as you was like, okay, you draw on two things. Well, Fernando as well. Fucking hell, Fernando's <laughs> shit all over the world. <laughs> well, that's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> but yeah, it's just um I think when I once I opened the uh possibility of coming out here and doing it, mm. that was when it's like, wow, okay, this can actually happen. And I think that changes the way you think about things then, like mo- uh, momentum and confidence and things like that is a huge thing. I think, you know, I would never have been doing something like this, having a conversation with you guys if I was back home living in Wales, to be honest. Um, yeah, so it's, it it definitely opened a lot of doors just from having the, the confidence to, to make the first movement. Do you, do you feel like you're going to stay in America now? Like, that's the goal? You want to be a citizen? Yeah, I think so. Um, I don't know. I, I, I feel like it's probably a time where I'd, I'd go back home for a little bit to live. Yeah, something in me that's kind of saying, like, oh, I probably, it, it would have to be something specific, you know, specific work-wise, though. I, I wouldn't just go back just to fuck around. And, yeah. You know, my, uh, my brother's <laughs> like, oh, would you ever come back to Northampton? And I was like, yeah, fucking like this. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, for me, it would be, fuck, it would have to be. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not coming back to soccer. If I came back to rugby, it'd have to be a fucking big job. England head coach job. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I was in um, when I was in Tokyo, I don't think I've ever said it publicly. When I was in Tokyo, I got offered a job at Biarritz for three years. Oh yeah. And they they fucking they they were basically like write your own job description, whatever. And I looked at it, I looked at Biarritz. I was like, but then yeah, I mean, thankfully. I said to him, I was like, oh, if you, if you match my wages, I'll leave Tokyo and come there for three years. And then because of the way the French tax laws work out, he's like, oh, you just asked for half a million euros. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, I don't earn that. So the answer is no. And I was like, okay, right. It's not going to happen. But yeah, I, I always, you know, for me, like, I was like, right. Once I made that decision in my head, like I want to be in America and I want to do this. Like, what, what do you, do you have a professional goal in mind that you want to work towards in America? I don't. Um, I think eventually I will. Mm. But I think uh, the stage that I'm at at the moment, the job that I had, the job, the job role that I have currently was something that I thought, okay, if, I go, if I'm going to move to America, that's what I want to get at. I want to get into school like that and, and coaching school like this. Um, but again, because I'm going through a, such a process, it's difficult for me to be like, right, this is my ultimate goal right now. Um, you have so much in the intermediate that you have to take yeah time. yeah because there's a like you should have that ultimate goal but i think at the moment there's so much other things mm. that are muddy in my waters that i really need to take care of first yeah um and I still, th- are you, are you mid, mid to late 20s no i'm 30 fucking hell you beautiful bastard you look so young <laughs> do i yeah <laughs> it's the it's the hair man it's giving me a nice glow yeah but um, I think once that's taken care of, I think that will really, you know, will open a lot of, it obviously open a lot of doors for me because I can actually start and feel like I actually live here and be like a real person at the moment. It's, it's difficult to continue to keep going and be like, yeah, I know like in two months time, I'll, I'll be able to go here or things like that because I had a few conversations with like MLR teams, which I was really, really interested yeah, in. Yeah, which we spoke about, yeah. Yeah, but I, I honestly, I couldn't take them. Because um, the money was so shit? No, because I'm, visa and you... I, I, cause I'm waiting for my green card. Um, right. So it's, it's rough, Matt. Yeah. Let me, uh, so, you know, I asked you off, off air if we, if we could talk about this, because obviously we'll get into it. 
your brother is a very, very famous bodybuilder. I think he's one of the most two twelves in Olympia history. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. James Lewis is your brother. Um, what is it like to grow up around a very successful sibling like that? Do you? Because I wanted to know. You're a successful individual in your own right. Your brother's very successful. He's you know built a huge name and business for himself. Is it the upbringing? you know, your, your family that kind of led to that, or is it you following your brother's role model? Talk to me about that. Um, I think of, to be honest, the job our, our parents did was phenomenal because they, like, I, I, I think it only dawns me when you're older, when you speak to other people and you're like, and they say like, Oh yeah, my parents didn't take me to this. So I didn't, mm. didn't have an opportunity to, to play this sport or whatever. And, and, and my parents, if we wanted to try something, they would take us, um no questions asked so that obviously had a huge huge impact on our ability or our opportunity the opportunity we had to try different things and be successful i think growing up with two older brothers i it was always very challenging and uh everything was a test everything was a competition um but he's seven he's eight years older than me so there was elements of competition but also then like almost like a, a third parent upbringing kind of thing to yeah. teach, me, teach me things um i think i do look at him in terms of yes that's motivating but at the same time i never wanted to be like okay i just want to copy what he does um definitely yeah i want to take take the kind of mindset that he has on what he's doing and implement it in my own way because as uh, people ask me like oh why don't you just jump into like present day people ask me like oh, why don't you live in vegas you you could be coaching all these nfl players things like that and yes that that, that is true but i think it's such a cop-out to be just just move to, to somebody else's gym and just utilize their connections uh, just from the jump because I want to work on something myself and build something on my own first. And then I'd feel like, okay, if I'm at a certain position, then I wouldn't mind going there and, and coaching these people. Um, I wouldn't want to move there and then be like, oh yeah, the only reason I'm coaching this person is because my brother owns the gym. Right. I used to work with a guy like that. So I used to work with a guy, how he got his job was that his dad owned the protein. <clears throat> And they were like, oh, but he loves he loves to train. And I was like, everyone loves to fucking train. <laughs> it doesn't mean you should be a fucking pro. It's interesting, you know, I, 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 watched, um, I watched a documentary. Have you heard of the comedy store in LA? It's like the mecca of like stand-up comedy where Richard Pryor, Robin Williams, okay. David Letterman, like everyone got their start there. And one of the things they talk about is the, the comedian, Paulie Shaw, his mother owned the club, but the comedy store was the last place that he ever did stand up wow. when he was coming up. He went to every other club because he didn't want people to say about him, like, Oh, you just got spots at the comedy store because your mother owns the place. Yeah. So that was and like, that was a conscious decision on your part. hundred percent because I, I want to support, I've, I've helped him out in, in like, you know, online stuff with his clothing or whatever. And, I, and any way I can help him, I'll do so. And the same for him, any support that he can, he can give me, he'll do, but I don't want, he always talks about building his legacy and I, my legacy, I don't want it to be like, Oh, great legs. You, you coach this, this, this person, this person, but they'll always be known as his brother. That would be the fucking worst thing for me just to, if I died, if I went there and, and did what I was doing and I died the next day, they'd be like, Oh, that flex was his brother. Yeah. Whereas, like I want people to look at me and be like, oh, fucking hell, he is this person. Yeah. And, oh wow, actually he's a soul. Well, yeah. I um well you, you've been depriving yourself from the struggle and the learning that comes from the struggle, and that's what you want. You just really want to enjoy the process, just not really going to the end of the movie. Just you don't know, fast forward and be like, Oh, that's how it ends. Yeah. You just want to watch it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You want to be part of it. You want to have your own movie, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's exactly. Easy to tell yourself that though on paper but obviously once once it starts to get hard because you know like you could you you know 
you could be like walk in the background of like a, a video or like something he's doing with the rock or like even your missus your missus has a third of a million followers on instagram yeah you could be like oh can i get the tag yeah exactly you know, all that kind of stuff <laughs> but yeah i think it's one of those things again it's always values aren't values until they're tested otherwise they're just verbal preferences yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I didn't actually realize what I said before we jumped on, I messaged you. Yeah. You you put it in the comment to say like, oh, did you actually think about distancing yourself? Mm-hmm. I didn't actually realize that it was, well, you said that you're good to that and you picked up on it, but I didn't realize it was like that, that obvious. Well, no, uh, you know, like I, I remember when we had first connected, I saw a picture of you guys together. I was like, fucking hell, they look similar. I was like, oh, they've got the same last name as well. <laughs> well I guess they're related. But um, it, it, Everyone in Wales enough. is related. Oh, fuck <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> James loved that one. I made James oh, love that not, you're, not, you're not wrong, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> it's like four. It's like four surnames. Get like ninety-five percent of the surnames are there. Lewis, Lewis is one of them. Jones, Tom, Morgan, Davis, Morgan. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry, it was five. <laughs> My bad. Love um, Wales. Love Wales. You know, interestingly enough, like I was aware of your brother when I was at university. So this is like fifteen years ago. I think it was just when he won the UK. So there was this like absolutely fucking nuts video of him in like a, a basement somewhere. Oh yeah. One week yeah. out, right? Yeah. I saw that and I was like, fucking hell, we're almost the same age. I was like, good God. And obviously you see how how his career has developed in in that intervening period. Mm-hmm. Do you do you getting a front seat to that? Do you see the evolution in like his his thinking, his business? And do you take stuff from that as well for yourself? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um I think when he it's easy to look at somebody that's um, at a certain level and think, okay, that person's unattainable. Yeah. Um, and I think he's slowly breaking down that barrier where he's like meeting these people. And that's when to me, it's like, okay, like that's actually real. Um, yeah. Because he is obviously still just my brother, but yeah. he is that level, but he's slowly gained that himself by meeting certain people, bringing them into a sort of the gym even when it was in Florida, that was a huge catalyst for him just to have something to, to offer these people, bring them in. Um, and his success obviously speaks for itself. So people that are outside of bodybuilding that are well-known names, they like, holy shit, this guy's won like seven Olympias. Okay, let's go to the gym. But then the business mind then for him, it's very interesting to see him tick in terms of, okay, like I can make this link, I can make this link. Um and he's not doing it in terms of like, oh, I'm going to benefit from this. But it's just how can you, how can he up, up, level up each time, level up each time. And some of the names that he'll, like, I'll call him and he'll just be like, oh, I just spoke to someone. So I'm like, fucking hell. Like, yeah. okay. <laughs> I, I don't have anything to say. You know? Like, how can I, what do I, what do I bat back? So I'll have to say, oh, I'll name it. And hopefully he'll know who the fuck you are. <laughs> a, a guy that you would know, that I know, he, uh, He's just like, put, just drops into the, the, the chat room. He's like, oh yeah, John Bon Jovi contacted me about personal training him today and he fucking turned him down. Oh, wait. <laughs> yeah, oh, my. Like, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't want to go to the Hamptons. Fuck that. So he turned him down. But yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting because we, we were talking, he and I, uh, similar to what we're talking about now, like, oh, you know, when people reach a certain level of, of success, being able to observe them and see you know what can i take away from this like that Mm -hmm. to me those two years in japan was two years of studying all blacks up close that's like what i the biggest thing i took away from it and we were talking about you know his his money and his business and he's like yeah you know i've met three billionaires now and i mean he's 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 very dry he's very funny he's like yeah they're all fucking weird (laughs) (laughs) big thing that he took away but it's, it's very interesting you know i always think you know if you're uh if you're a people watcher, to yeah. What you know, what in a good way? People watcher in a good way. Yeah, not as a, not, <laughs> not weirdly and uh... yeah. <laughs> so uh, um, you, maybe, you maybe both ways, but I know I just you just yeah for coaches right like we do observe a lot and you just learn behavior at the end like when you go past your reps and your sets and your 
your templates and all that you just understand like that innate culture that will understand they need and they just work to develop it's just w- watching people and learning from anyone is it even yeah. like was it like the term like the not the negative leaders but like so sort of like the negative examples that are also really good in your life for what you don't want to do or how you don't want to behave um so yeah exactly <laughs> that's like some fucking uh jim Rohn shit have you ever heard of jim Rohn? no uh, rohn he's like no. he's like self-help not jim yeah, Rohn. I said self-help guru from uh guru. he died like 10 years ago but i was like a voracious consumer of self-help material back in the day i still probably am but anyway yeah, one of the things he said, you know, there's, you can learn from everyone. Some of them are examples and some of them are warnings. Yeah, I, I think um, the good thing about being in the position that I'm in is anytime we go to somewhere public that is based around bodybuilding, so like expos, the Olympia, and things like that, it's, it's really interesting. So I am a bit of a people watcher in terms of like take a step back and I'll see like the people in the line or people that are like well-known people in the industry, how they interact with like a normal person or what they're saying before they actually get to my, to my brother and see who like switches, who like says something different. And when they get to him, then it switches. So I'll just be in the background like, okay, then it's cool. Like there's, there's a lot of clues. The body language is always kind of the same. Um, yeah, I like to just stand in the back, give the eye ball and be like, yeah, I fucking knew you earlier. I heard you about two minutes ago. You're a fucking yeah. asshole. <laughs> but, well, do, you, do, you mean, do you mean that always like in, in, a, in a bad way or maybe sometimes, you know, like that song from the um, from Bruce Springsteen, like the brilliant disguises and like you do use different sort of like faces per se to talk to different people, uh, not necessarily like in a deceiving way, but as in like, you know, I don't talk the same way I talk to my mom that I talk to Kia because she could this is a bit less so you know what i mean <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah it's um i don't know i think it's very interesting to see how people interact with each other in those in those places and then when they get to something somebody that has notoriety how they will change their um the, their body language or the, what they're saying to make themselves look a certain way um I've, yeah so it's very interesting to see like the changes of the masks basically just to make themselves look a little bit better so i like that being in that position yeah and i try and do that in real life then to be like okay like i what kind of person is this person going to be um yeah. is this a mask or is it not yeah because a lot of the time that I, I had to be on my guard a little bit at the beginning when I moved here because a lot of people would be like, oh, do you want to train together? And then we would train somewhere local and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, can I go to the, your brother's gym and, and uh, can I meet your brother? I'm like, well, is this, was this the fucking plan all along? Like, Yeah. So, got a couple of names here. As I've, as I've matured, the rule I've made is never fuck dancers because <laughs> the, the more visible someone's job is and the more they're being judged by other people the more insecure and absolutely fucking mental they are and it seems to me like bodybuilding is very similar in that regard like you're being judged every single yeah. day and it's almost like people build up a wall and be like as fake not as fake as possible but like it it's very subjective and you're under the spotlight mm-hmm. it seems to me there's a real big contrast there between you being in that environment where obviously everyone is trying to build themselves up to be better than they are. Whereas you look to like ATT and you working in combat sports, it's almost the reverse. Like because you're being exposed every day in training, you almost have to walk around with more humility than you might need to, because there's, you know, people can beat the shit out of you. (laughs) you Notice that big like cultural difference. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There was no fluff or anything like that in the, in the combat world, um, MMA world. Um, yeah, I feel like in terms of the perfor- their performance, it's essentially, you know, it's fighting. So, I, I mean, there was there was no fluff or, or like bullshit talk. I feel like if things had to be said, they were just said straight because otherwise, if, it, if there's like bullshit around, they 
<laughs> you're surrounded yeah. by people that could just fucking knock your head off. <laughs> <laughs> now, the the, the cross pollination. You know, people are always like to me, "What have you learned from American football?" And certainly, when people when people talk about the pollination between combat sports or MMA and rugby, it's always from the direction of MMA to rugby. So the inclusion of grappling and all that good stuff. Yeah. Well, what is it that you feel you you brought to that environment or that MMA can take from rugby? Planning the week. Um, really, even if they didn't have the technology, just tra- just making sure that you can, you're can you tracking some kind of global loading, like the volume and everything like that without... I, I don't know. If you came to ATT and you saw some of the training sessions initially... They would a lot of the guys can like slip under the radar where they would go S S and C, they would go straight into wrestling. And then we would be like essentially chasing them, chasing them around the gym and be like, you need to go home now. And you'd see them outside running, road running, because in their in their head, like they just have to just train, train, and train. Um and I think rugby has a better understanding of actually planning the week and having recovery. In, in within the week so that's kind of what I brought in was like okay we consolidate stresses in terms of working with the skills coach a little bit closer than what what was actually happening mm. when do you do this how tough is it actually on the athlete like is is sparring more difficult than than Steve Mocker's wrestling class like how are we doing this and then kind of putting together let's, let's put these together on one day uh recovery day or this day or you could do this um whereas previously it's very like 100 mile an hour because every single person has their own specific area that they're specialized on whether it's striking grappling wrestling and everyone's trying to pull 100 percent from each person um and i think the main thing that didn't doesn't help at times is that if you have 50 professional athletes in one group and they're all different weight categories and they're all like training to be the best. There's going to be an element where they're going to be like, I'm going to fucking go hundred percent now against this person and show the, show the coach that I'm the, the best middleweight in this, in this gym. Mm. Um, because you're training individuals, even though they're a team, you know, they want to show that they are the best in the gym. Um, so it's kind of understanding that and just being like, okay, they can't be fucking hundred mile an hour every single day. Is Mike Brown's the head coach, right? Yeah, yeah. Is is he the, the controller of those elements? So schedule, content, it, you know, intensity, volume, frequency, or is it, if you're a strength coach at ATT, you're, you're just trying to like guide and chip in as opposed to, yeah. right, how should it look? Yeah, they, they have like a set, that when I was there, they had a set schedule of when they did each class. Yeah. Um, in terms of like intensity volume, I d- they didn't have anything that they cleaned was, up the mess it, around them. Yeah, it was just like okay, we're going to work on this this skill. Yeah, for the hour, and then we're going to progress it to this. Um, and you know, this is not me saying like what they were doing is is poor practice or anything, but in terms of like from our stand <laughs> from our standpoint, yeah. we're like they yeah. like yeah, like what well, what are we like how difficult is this session? So you, we would get guys and we'd have to just fully like do an, almost an assessment, be like, how, how do you feel before we start? And then change the, the training session if they, if they were being back, if they were actually battered in that, in that strike into, uh, session. Um, but yeah, we, in terms of strength and conditioning aspect, we would just kind of chip in and say like, this is what we're doing on this day um, in hopes that, what we were doing, they would agree with and that it would match up in terms of like the stresses of the day. Um, Are they training twice a day? Yeah. AM, yeah. PM? Yeah. Interesting. So they have, usually they have like 50 odd people um, in in two groups. And then if, you, if you're talking about like top five UFC, they w- we would do individual one-on-one SSC with them then said. So that was, that was the good thing is when when they were at a certain level, they had one-on-one stuff with us and they would have one-on-one sparring and boxing. 
Um, so that was a bit better then because you could control then the stressors and the volume and everything that was going into their training program. But in terms of like local level pros, those guys are just that, that would, that's the thing. I feel like it's very difficult to be a local level pro in MMA because you want to prove that you're good enough, but also it's like being in team bin juice because you're like can and fought <laughs> to the fucking pros. They're like, Hey, you know, you just did like a full uh, class of, of BJJ, right? Uh, Dustin needs a sparring partner in you go. Hmm. Um, so it's kind of like you have to earn your stripes before you get that opportunity to work one-on-one with, with the coaches and, and the SNC. Right, Make it, worst, it or break uh, it. Is it? Make it or break it. Make it or break it, yeah. <laughs> what's been juice of wasps with the A-League? Like, I don't know how it is now. They used to play the A-League on a Monday night. And obviously Tuesday is your biggest training day if you, if you play on Saturday in the Prem. Yeah. And they fucking, they sent these boys down to Exeter. So they drove from West London to Exeter, which is like a four Fuck. and a half to five hour drive. Yeah. They played Exeter, got their fucking pants pulled down at like 7 p.m. They were back on the bus at 9.30, got back at three in the morning. And the next morning they had to be fucking team binges for the first team. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fucking yeah. brutal. I mean, just out of curiosity, uh, the, the SNC at ATT are they taking a percentage of the, the fight purse or is it like the gym hires the SNC yeah. and it's a flat rate or gym flat rate yeah interesting yeah, yeah. but then the, the I believe the gym has X percentage of the, the actual purse then on top of on, yeah the, like the gym I believe would win it I don't know how they how they would separate it out but then there was a lot of the, a lot of the money that the, the gym actually made was from general pop classes. Um, they were they were full all the time. BJJ wrestling, striking, like kids classes, general pop. It was yeah, yeah. it was busy. Yeah, I mean, I I know uh, not on the, the training side, but other people that work with fighters, and it would be you know like three you know three percent three percent of the purse. Mm. So. You're, you're kind of rolling the dice where if your fighter loses, you get 50% of what you could have got. Yeah. But when they win and when they start to climb up, and if you ever get like a pay per view, like, fuck, you know, you're laughing. Yeah. But I think it's, it's interesting that you can have certain athlete stakeholders where the interests are clearly aligned, where if you do well, I do well. If I do bad, you do yeah. bad. But so, then yeah. it's not, maybe it's like that needs to be that mm, further evolution. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Let's do it, bro. Let's start out. Yeah. I'm down. Let's do it. <laughs> um, they, they, they opened one. They opened an American top team in, um, in State College. Really? Yeah. But it was only a small little place. I spoke to Dan Lam, but if he, if he has any plans on making like an SSC area, I'd love to be involved. Yeah. But um, I think it's quite early on at the moment. That's, uh, that's one of the few sports that I would like to do besides you know rugby or football that i'd kind of said uh publicly um i've, I've never i've never told this story publicly but apparently there was, there's a very very big organization within mma that had had plans to build a facility in uh mexico and uh yes yeah, possibly <laughs> they, 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 See. They, found, they found this place they're like right we're gonna we, we sign the lease start hiring the staff, start building or whatever. And then it turns out that the building that they had intended to lease was owned by the cartel. The cartel <laughs> found out who the client was. And they're like, oh, the, uh, the lease just doubled. And they're like, okay, I guess we're not building. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so. Yeah. Oh, man. Just, it's just a random organization. Anyway. Yeah. Um, Think of anyone. Where can, where can people find you? Uh, predominantly doing my stuff on Instagram. Um, so Lukey Lou too. I tried to, I did like a little vote poll to see if maybe I could go away from Lukey Lou too because I started it. When when I started my account, it was just me just being a normal bloke. I was just like made my my name. Yeah. But uh, the people have spoken and they want Lukey Lou too. So it's like one of those those embarrassing teenage like emails that you have when you have 12 yeah. and you're a grown man. Excuse me, did you say 
<laughs> Fernando, OG, and all that stuff. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what, what my, Instagram, Instagram. <laughs> my Instagram to this day is loves to spooge 69. <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's easy to find for people, that, that's the thing, isn't it? But well, nowadays, yeah. you can like share profiles and tag people, so it's easy, so it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Thank you very much. No, it's been awesome. Appreciate you uh, you wanting me on, boys. Um, this has been this has been great. Thank you, brother. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Right.